And I'm guessing you want the podium? What's up? Do you want? Okay, so I'm going to move back up a little bit. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, Ian, our next reader is Ian O'Neill. He's in his second semester of the MFA program with a secondary focus in poetry and a primary focus on himself. <laughs> I think you should do stand-up. Wait to hear the rest. If Ian had an eHarmony account, it would say, Ian's a Gemini who loves long walks by moonlight around the craters of live volcanoes. He likes the word sultry because you can't say it and not feel creepy. His favorite drinking game is Scrabble. His favorite tool is the bow saw. He's never lost a knife fight. I don't even want to know what that means. And at times he feels like a matador in a bar of mechanical bulls. Oh, and he's going to read you some poems. All right. See, I'm not even going to explain. I think there's only one poem I need to kind of give you an explanation about. I'm just going to dive right in. So, this one is called Roots. I like to think my ancestors were slaves. While I am white, they were black, and blue and new rage has a taste that is coppery and a cauterized flesh. It arises in the chest like steam off of slag and clots in the throat with blood that can't be swallowed. If you're gored through the ribs by a foot of Roman iron, I like to think my ancestors were slaughtered when Germanicus marched north and brought his axe to the forest, strewing ashes like seed, burying bones like a beast. I like to think of my forefathers on a ridgeline, barrels and avalanche, the fight of a flurry. Racing one another, racing one another to break on Roman shields like saplings and frost. I like to think of my ancestors singing, singing as they shattered, singing like wolves, singing like a brush fire, singing like the ring of pickaxes on stone, deep in a salt mine where they'd be banished from the sky, where blood black, where blood ran like black sapphire, and dust shimmered in the sweat, where they were radiant as stars while dying beneath the lash. Um, right, this one, the only thing you need to know about this one is every line has to start with the same letter. So it's going to be really R sounding because the titles are. All right. Rosie has a bend, the student driver purrs, rubbernecking the nine car inferno, nervous rain dancing down her spine, praying for a glimpse of rosy cheer love wrapped in flames, and rear ends the focus, idling in front of her. Really screams a woman jacking the boxing out the door, reaching back for an unlicensed firearm. As a man riding a shotgun calmly murmurs, honey. Honey, is that really necessary? While the driving instructor remembers he forgot his Kevlar vest today, realizes he's powerless in the passenger's, passenger seat, screams reverse, throw it in reverse as an off-duty rent-a-cop roulettes across the dash, ruin the fresh detailing as the rodeo clowns head first into a surgically reassuring smiles of a local news team, running in a banner down the side of the city bus. The recoiling barrage of his fumbled assault rifle frolicking past car rims and blasting out rear windows strafing commuters, rabbiting from sedan doors, only the candy remembering to stop, drop, and red the student driver, ugh. Rosie Spence is red. All right, um, all right, this one's called Ninth Street Bridge. You've been to Ocean City, you know it's not. Come sunset in the summer town, families flock to the bay where the sky is a witch burning, alive with the screams of gulls. Stealing Cheez-Its and caviar, strafing first dates with shit, the costing civic garbage bins and crowing of the take. They sort of the bridge and jive in the right lane, in a colony gathered round to envy their success, to watch without blinking as they struck down the striped line, like stereotype prospectors in a black and white mining town, who only enter saloons if they're kicking it in the doors, who whoop while they choke on gold nuggets swallowed whole, who are unaware of upon their catwalk, the minivan cresting the bridge, is engulfed by the sunset, the sky of cooling blood, spurting in the eyes of the driver as they explode through the party like a collapsing mine shaft. So when the local paper ran a piece of Hallmark and Hysteric, about tarsals and tail feathers and corpses of gulls, strewn in the bridge bike lane, I used that day's paper to soak up spilled milk because who wants to read a commentary so crass it bemoans the beauty when karma gets cut through. <laughs> Um, what is this one? It's called the Covered Bridge. I don't know what I'm allowed to do. But, you, know, you, got you just yeah, you just gotta <laughs> stop that mouth. Stop. The Covered Bridge. By our eighth step, the cracks had started to growl, 
Eight steps into the depths of the covered bridge before I touched your elbow, thumb straight hairs off your cheek. Took the lead and eight steps deeper, the air had died, leaving a scent like the undersides of rocks. Where planks were missing, nails were made. The wall slats were rattling, uncertain as peeling shutters, and you picked a spider web off of your tongue, claiming it was no great loss to have never hunted big game. But you'd always regret never dancing in our way. By the eighth step of what might have been, but likely wasn't the waltz, floor struts were bowing beneath the dampening soles of our boots, and the safety of the bridge end was lit like a crack in a child's door, while, over, while overhead surged skeins of panicking birds sputtering through light, sputtering light through the gaps in the roof. And it took those eight steps to sense you close your eyes and hear the warmth when you whispered, dip me, babe, over the floorboards, splintering and cackling, like a pack of hyenas come upon our son. Uh, this one is called Barber. In my grandfather's town, I told the barber I had good timing, that whenever I came, I never waited for a chair. And the barber, he told me, he never quit biting his nails. That he began in the extermination camp, where he first became a barber. He said it was all about warmth, always about warmth, when the day is little more than an hour. So he gnawed in his fingers, chiseling nails into talons that he used on his bunk mates, cropping hair mist like guards which they'd mix with icy strips from the uniforms of the dead, fetal and frozen, pushed to the sides of pathways, festooning the barbed wire. Clustered, clustered around their fire, his bunk vast in the scent of burning hair. But heat is fleeting, and when days are short, men are like trees, this splinter and crack and die with no sound. You find your bunk made dead in the tepid dawns which followed the long nights, when the warmth of his breath wasn't frozen on your neck, and that's what I told new arrivals in herds on the station platform, that they'd miss the boxcar, they'd pine for its warmth, when the day is just a cell in the cancer of the night. A man burned for heat, when calloused from the cold. He knew for heat he needed fire, and for fire he needed fuel, and it was damn hard to leave the crematoria when the blast furnaces were making the bricks sweat. And with the awareness that this was his fire, his tinder and gristle, so he'd chew his nails and march into the cold, now to the sentries who dropped their rifles and rub his shaved head until the frost melted from their gloves. With ice in their smile, they'd speak words of smoke. Two more guys? Sure. Cool. All right. Um, uh, this was called Aftertaste. I'm reminded of the summer I worked on villas with villains. I remember that we spoke of turf wars and guttural tongues. Come dusk every Friday, we'd silence cicadas and drive fledglings from nest in the bowels of an unnamed cul-de-sac in the basement of some half-finished lot. We'd fight for a view in the toothless gaps between studs, or scramble over loose shingles and ring empty skylights. We fill our arena with howling Mexican roofers doing their bastardized group dance of sweat, samba, and bloodlust. The thundering war drums as clans from the rainlands clap slates of spare limestone while dousing each other in gas from brandished brick saws. With sighting crews of Koreans assessing each fighter in clouds of exhaled smoke, weighing the heavies in their impact driver pigeon. The bobcats would roar and the giants would duel, Gary with his tack hammer circled Julio on his cat's ball. Two dozen dialects to wager half a day's pay, the foreman would nod and shake wood shavings from the books. Time, like that summer, has an aftertaste like sand and spackle, and nests in the throat like huffed quick sets of men. And passing the lots now as the sun sets at their back, seeing the last gas skip through the framing. It's like watching an eclipse through the rib cages of whales, bleached by the heat laid bare by shifting dunes, and it's warm in the eye like a punctured lungs hack. And the taste in my mouth where the cheek leaves the jaw, it's like blood mixed with chalk, like black coffee, black gravel. We'll do one more. Do a... Do this one. Do Calabunga. Right, do me a favor. Give me all the rest of the papers. Yeah, they're full. Because <laughs> <laughs> we want to hear you read it. All right. All right, Calabunga. I've been wearing this Catch-22 like a chip on my shoulder, been going all Sisyphus-esque for a grip on this yoke between scratching the living and cannibalizing my pride. So I guess you need thick skin when time's in inquisition and train you with thin subsistence and iron maiden. Time when belts need tightening, like now, here, kicking my sign on the shoulder of this road, exsanguinating my ego as every second passerby drums into their horn, beating me like a speed bag. Well, I got thick skin. You need it out front of the Halloween outlet when 18 wheelers explode by spraying gravel, spraying gravel buckshot and molten, and molten tires like boomerangs. When littering is cherished pastime, much like trap shooting or axe throwing. Yeah, my skin is thick here, modeling Michelangelo 2010 fall line. 
the shell of who I was is sweating away what I am. Here, in an $85 jumpsuit before taxes and shame, curling nunchucks at roadkill, in line for a homicide that is four o'clock gridlock. Barry, it's all up like a Disney prince, pirouetting down the median, was nearly guillotined by a hubcap. Gretchen, a slutty Shirley Temple, got blindsided with a frappuccino. They don't have thick skin, not like me, here. Sticks bait on the asphalt, turtling between my shoulders in case I'm recognized, in case my mask shifts. Here, peeking around the edge of my signboard, signboard, wishing for the power to turn invisible or make good my resolutions, such as quitting, taking up the bindle, or hurling myself into oncoming traffic. But I've got thick skin, so I'd probably pinball off fenders and cartwheel past windshields before dusting myself off and going back to work, before tightening my, before tightening my belt to keep this shawl from slipping down. Mm -hmm.